to the annual meeting of the Carl Jaspers Society of North America. The topic of today's session is Jaspers Nietzsche interpretation. Carl Jaspers wrote toward the end of his life in a letter to Hans Sander on 3, December, on 3 September 1966, to be precise, that Nietzsche caught through looking ahead glimpses of the turning point of the earth, Blicke in die Weltwende, and that he was unlike other philosophers, rather that he was something fundamentally different from them, the normal philosophers, he was an event, an Ereignis. Having this in mind, I now tell you who our four speakers are. Dirk Johnson will first assess and evaluate Jasper's interpretation of Nietzsche's book, The Antichrist. This is followed by Rolando Perez's investigation of Miguel de Unamonos, irrationalism and how it is it unfavorably contrasts with Carl Jasper's emphasis on reason. Afterwards, Martin Prange will scrutinize what it means to live truth for Nietzsche and Jaspers. And last but not least, Babette Babic will examine closely what universities are, what their mission is, and how these objectives can be kept through their fruitful implementation. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you your first speaker, Dear Johnson, is Elliot Professor of German at Hampton Sydney College. He is the author of the book Nietzsche's Anti-Darwinism, published by Cambridge University Press in 2010. Last year, he published in the New Cambridge Companion to Nietzsche an essay titled Zarathustra, Nietzsche's Rendezvous with Eternity. And now he will be speaking about Jasper's reading of Nietzsche's Antichrist. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm very excited to be here. And I will argue here that Jasper summarizes Nietzsche's appraisal of Christ and the rise of Christianity, but fails, in my opinion, to capture the strategies behind the polemical text. In part, this is due to Jasper's allegiance to Heidegger, in my opinion. Nietzsche, Nietzsche's text um, has four main points, in my view. That Christianity became the interpretational vehicle through which resentment values have been enshrined as the default values for mankind. Uh, his four guiding principles are, uh, as I see it, A, Christ presented mankind with a practice, not a message. B, Christ's actions revealed an overcoming of resentment. C, his followers' underlying resentments created the false message of Christian Christianity. And D, finally, that Christ was a decadent. To point A, Nietzsche insists that Christ did not offer a cogent message about his actual teachings, let alone a cohesive belief system. For Nietzsche, Christ's words were verbal approximations of inner states of consciousness that had little correlation with concrete reality. Christ conveys a sense of, uh, of bliss for having overcome all oppositions, and he used highly symbolic language to express that inner richness. The importance of Christ, however, was not in the language he used, but in the actions that sprang from his inner awareness. The message of Christ Nietzsche repeatedly emphasized was the practice of living like Christ, modeling a way of living. In fact, one could still be a Christian today by emulating a Christ-like life. Christ had no resentment. For this reason alone, Nietzsche respects him and sees in him a higher human type. It was the essence of his message. Diese frohe Botschaft starb, wie er lebte, wie er lehrte, nicht um die Menschen zu erlösen, sondern um zu zeigen, wie man zu leben hat. The grandeur of Christ lay in rejecting any form of resentment. Nicht sich wehren, nicht zürnen, nicht verantwortlich machen, sondern auch nicht dem Bösen widerstehen, ihn lieben. Uh, so, now to C, point C. Uh, after Nietzsche has presented his two summary points, that Christ's message was a way of living and that expressed freedom from resentment, Nietzsche condemns Christianity for what it has become, a belief system and not a practice that contradicted everything that Christ stood for. The key point in his subsequent analysis is this, Christianity became an interpretive cloak for foundational resentment. While res Christianity did not first cre create resentment, for recurring resentment is fundamentally human, uh, it gave that effect responsibility, respectability, sorry, by allowing individuals to rec uh, reconfigure their resentment instincts into a conviction of their higher moral value and worth. It allowed pitiful souls 
to believe that the world revolved around them and that their belief accorded them a higher status. Das Heil der Seele auf Deutsch, die Welt dreht sich um mich. What Nietzsche condemns and aren't the many untruths and lies Christianity sanctions, but that it could coalesce into a master interpretation in which resentment values were both validated and rendered permanent. With Christianity begins resentment as interpretation. Uh, D. Finally, Nietzsche's main criticism of Christ, despite admiring his lack of resentment, was that it was a decadent. There are two important components of this. For one, it indicates that Christ's life and example were unique to Christ and expressed his particular physiological constitution. For Nietzsche, all philosophies reflect actual life practices and are symptomatic of a specific life lived. Uh, sie kommen nur als Symptome in Betracht. Secondly, Christ's life reflected an overall decadent physiology that avoided pain and removed itself from life in itself a morbid form of hedonism. Eine sublime Weiterentwicklung des Hedonismus auf durchaus morbide Grundlage. Christ's response to life emerged from an aversion to pain and heartbreak, but it is not given to everyone, in fact, not to most normally constituted types, to live a life so instinctually detached from the natural world. Christ cannot serve as a model for those who are immersed in life and who must bear its brunt. In this case, overcoming resentment means mastering life and assuming an affirmative stance. The goal is not outward adherence to a belief, but leading to an act of life free from resentment. Whereas points A, B, and D deal with the historical figure of Christ, as well as Nietzsche's attempt, despite a contradictory historical record, to adequately depict him, point C unfolds Christianity's rise out of the spirit of resentiment. We can now turn to what Jaspers gets wrong, in my opinion, about Nietzsche's interpretation. Jaspers approaches Christianity as an historical phenomenon in chronological time. It is as though Christianity were a concrete, definable entity that can be unmasked and overturned, thereby ushering a new era. Nietzsche's Vernichtungswille gegen das Christentum, um mit diesem zugleich den Nihilismus zu überwinden durch eine neue Philosophie. But Nietzsche does not define Christianity in that way. The brilliance of Nietzsche's critique and what is truly original about it is that he avoids seeing Christianity as a monolithic historical entity, but rather as a confluence of associations arising from a morbid physiological bedrock. Christianity is not, Christianity is not a force within a sequence of time. It is a way in which these types make sense of their instinctual confusion. The nihilism of the present, however, is not the progressive linear of end result of Christian history. The nihilism of the present is reflected in the new worldviews that fill that void, be it in the form of democracy, socialism, anarchism, or liberalism. The latter movements did not progress out of Christianity, but are rather alternatives for the same subset of resentment instincts. Jasper then commits the same fallacy that has long impeded Nietzsche research, in my opinion, namely seeing the Übermensch as a transition out of and beyond Christianity. Jasper assumes, along with Heidegger, that Nietzsche's thinking represents a total system. He speaks of the thought, not the thinker. But it is exactly the reverse. Nietzsche proceeds from the thought to the thinker, to what the thinking reveals about the thinker. In fact, the need for totality around its system is just another expression of decadence. In that sense, Nietzsche's critique does not point to one system replacing Christianity. It expresses his own independence an independence of mind, mind and will, summarizing an aspect of his uh, Kriegspraxis or art of war, Nietzsche writes, die Aufgabe ist nicht überhaupt über Widerstände Herr zu werden, sondern über solche, an denen man seine ganze Kraft, Geschmeidigkeit und Waffenmeisterschaft einzusetzen hat, über gleiche Gegner. In conclusion, we can ask ourselves, what did Jas Jaspers actually intend with his study? While he shows himself to be a sensitive reader, not explicitly taking sides for or against Nietzsche, it is unclear if he actually endorses his anti-Christian critique or whether he subtly intends to challenge it and thereby to rescue Christianity from Nietzsche's heavy art artillery. The fact that Jasper believes Nietzsche oversimplified his rival and that he portrays Nietzsche as a prophet-like figure who intended to dislodge Christianity single-handedly from the world historical stage implies a negative verdict, both in regards to Nietzsche's critique and his intent. 
But the reading I presented indicates that Jasper is misguided here. It is clear that Nietzsche, with his nuanced, delicate rendition of Christ, treats him with great respect and admiration. Even if he concludes that Christ resembled a Buddha-like figure who, in Buddha-like fashion, renounced the world. Whom Nietzsche does, does condemn are those who fail to exhibit any Christ-like actions or demeanor, or attempt to live a life free of resentment as Christ himself had modeled, but instead use patched work mischaracterizations of his life and words to delude, to delude themselves and others into thinking that their petty lives of resentment and misery were superior to those who aspired to lives of virtue, honor, and distinction. The Unsterblichkeit jedem Petrus und Paulus zugestanden war bisher das größte, das bösartigste Attentat auf die vornehme Menschlichkeit. A truthful, honest reckoning, reckoning with historical Christianity and its very confusing origins should, on the other hand, enable us to detach those instincts that have been directed toward false values and to reclaim and reaffirm those instincts that have, in turn, been devalued and suppressed by Christianity and to reassert those as a basis for a higher human type. Nietzsche's Antichrist should clear the air and set us on that course. But a reading that mischaracterizes the man and emphasizes a mythopoetic view of both the thinker and his thought not only fails to do justice to the goals and intentions of the subtle text, it also contributes to the sad, fateful legacy of misrepres misrepresenting the thinker to the disservice of his thinking. I like a lot how you formulate Nietzsche's central message, namely that Christianity became the interpretational vehicle through which resentment values have been enshrined as the default values for mankind. Um, and um, that the main teaching of Christ is, is actually about overcoming resentment. Uh, and what Nietzsche appreciated was Christ's message uh, as a way of living, and that this was expre uh, ex expressed as freedom from resentment. Now, my question is, I have actually four points, so um, I hope that uh, you can follow me. First point. Okay. How can Nietzsche admire Christ's behavior on the cross as the example of living a life free from resentment and then claim that Christ's life and example reflect, I quote, an overall decadent physiology that avoided pain and removed itself from life? And I ask this because my second point, could it also be possible that a life free from resentment is a life free from pain and heartbreak, a life of detachment. If uh, this point would be true, then immersing in life, as we should do according to Nietzsche, and thus pain, would mean not overcoming resentment. Living and embra embracing pain then means Accept that feelings like anger, resentment, vengefulness are part of life as much as love. In other words, embracing life as a human being means we can't live like saints. We can't live like Christ. Because good and bad emotions, I don't think that Nietzsche distinguish, distinguishes between the two, uh, they are two sides of the same coin, according to Nietzsche. That means to affirm life is to live, to live it in all its emotional chaos, ups and downs. And this means as a human being, you're sometimes an anklager and sometimes a saint. But it's just never persistent. Uh, according to Nietzsche, everything changes, life changes, but we as human beings, we cannot hold to this uh, level of the same, so to speak. So what we then need to affirm is basically this, accept that nothing is permanent. So this would mean that the goal is not, as you write, leading an active life free from resentment, but affirming life as change accept that feelings of resentment are part of a full emotional human life, but just not to make this uh, feeling of resentment of, or value of resentment the prevalent value of a belief system. This then leads me to, uh, to the final point. 
So we should distinguish between, make a good distinction, strong distinction between Nietzsche's validation of Christ, the figure, and Nietzsche's fight against Christianity as a belief system, as a form of nihilism. Maybe uh, we should do this perhaps even because Nietzsche wants to shed light on the real teachings of Christ, which uh, comes down to the practice of love, uh, free from any resentment. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of what you said, uh, and I and I'm, I think you made a good point by saying it's not necessarily, and I'm, I should uh, should probably have uh, qualify that or change that when I said not a, not a life free from resentment. In fact, earlier in, in the talk, I said that um, it, that resentment is a, a recurring thing, and that we have to deal with that, and that is a part of um, of life, living life fully, is that you're going to have moments yeah. of resentment. Um, yeah. So I would ab absolutely agree with you. It's not a life necessarily free from resentment, but a life that doesn't get uh, undermined by resentment or become dominated by resentment. Um, maybe it's better to say it that way. I still do think that he sees La uh, Nietzsche, uh, Jesus' example is not something um, that is something unique to Jesus and that he does see it as a, a decadent form of life in the sense that um, it is all basically internal it's it's uh it's a he was a certain type that found bliss by overcoming all these oppositions um but it was in a sense of uh backing off living in a system in, in his head in a way and not necessarily um it it, it it is impossible as a belief system as believing these kind of inner of, of love and overcoming of opposition um, but I wouldn't say it is something that Nietzsche believed is possible for the average person. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. That that this is that, that Jesus' example was actually removing himself from a lot of the uh, of a lot of tensions and problems and cultivating an inner peace, which is Nietzsche finds a commendable uh, Buddha-like possible. Um, uh, attitude toward life. Why does uh, Nietzsche need the person of Christ and how honest between brackets is his interpretation? For this interpretation to a certain extent is very traditional and it starts in 19th century. Christ is good, or Jesus is good, Christianity is wrong and made it wrong. So, and uh, hey, um, Nietzsche could have included uh, the person of Jesus himself in this criticism, but he doesn't. Uh, he could have said Christ is wrong and Christianity was uh, uh, con uh, the, the consequence of it, but he wants to, to make that distinction. How, uh, and, uh, and, and then within this distinction, he makes uh, Christ to a kind of um, incarnation of his own idea of morality. And uh, the, the, the comparison with, with Buddhism is, is very, uh, uh, of course, uh, is a kind of construction. So what really does he want and how honest is, what, what is the, the existential motivation of, 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 of Nietzsche to, to keep up uh, and uh, with the person of, of Jesus Christ? Why? Well, I don't think it's, I think it's a, I think it's a critique. I don't think he... I think he wants to separate the individual from the belief system because mm -hmm. I think that we are focused on the belief system that came after Christ rather yeah. than looking at Christ as, a, as an historical figure, as a human being, yeah. as a yeah. human being in his time. And everything else is just an elaboration of what we think um, Jesus was about. But And he gives his interpretation of what Jesus was about, but he thinks it's more honest because it's just reducing him to a human being. He's like, let's avoid talking about Christianity, good, bad, whatever. Let's look at the figure of Christ and let's try to make, uh, make sense of him. Everything else is just blah, blah, blah. And why does he want that? Does, uh, does Jesus Christ still have a meaning for Nietzsche in, in his modern time? So he, it's a kind of well, criticism I, 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 of Christianity, uh, but is it uh, for Nietzsche a kind of belief or uh, does he still want to maintain a kind of um, and to and to defend a value of the person of Jesus Christ in modern times, something like that. I think that he thinks that Nietzsche is. He keeps on saying is sort of like a, a Buddha and a sehr un Buddha mäßige Landschaft, right? I mean, he is sort of a, a Buddha-like figure that probably, if if we can make sense of him, 
would most closely resemble in his message mm -hmm. a, a Buddha like uh, practice. So it's just trying to say, how can we minimize pain? How can we cultivate yeah. the inner life? Yeah. And can, it doesn't say that you have to believe yeah. in it. But it just yeah. says can it, 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 practices, it, it, practices. And it functions as a criticism of Christianity and it does not function in a positive way for uh, Nietzsche's own philosophy. Can I, right. can I get in I here so. uh, that Christ seeks death? One has to think about that. Second, he says that Christ loves too much. And I'd go back to Martina's uh, comment about love. Is it possible to love too much? And that would mean that there is in fact in Christ no negation. It's all interior. And if there's no negation, it undercuts what Nietzsche wants to do, it seems to me, in terms of his own philosophy. Uh, at that point, you've got an acceptance of Christ, but a criticism of him in that he is too much of one thing, mm -hmm. too, as it were, undefined. Uh, and uh, in that sense, Christ is the opposite of Socrates, who is too overdefined. And Nietzsche finds himself in between Socrates mm -hmm. and Christ with some sense of trying to find something which is not, does not fall into either camp. It seems to me that's true. But the seeking death is very important. It's one of the judicial suicides, compares him directly with Socrates. But then you can't rescue Christ that way. Um, he's also, he does not in the end make, I've written about this in the, in the Conway volume, uh, he does not really allow you to make the distinction of, well, Jesus was a good guy, but Paul was a shit. <laughs> I mean, he resists that. Uh, there's a little bit of it, but not very much. And uh, he really thinks that the, two, the one leads to the other, and that's the problem. The razor sharp distinction, I think the key, the key thing is that um, that like Jesus is a practice. That is, it's a life practice. It's the right. I emphasize the action on the on the thing. What he's focusing is on it's an uh, that Jesus is a body uh, in nature that has to act. All of us as human beings act. It's okay what, what's going on in our mind, but we that is also always translated into action somehow, and or in a non-action, which is an action. So basically. Uh, by focusing on action, he's saying the practice is always possible, but Jesus has to be also held accountable for his actions and his practices, the choices he makes, which are, you know, we have those, some of those examples of those choices he makes, including the action on the, on, on the cross. So I think that, that what Nietzsche wants to find is sort of not something that denies the possibility of action, but is action and stands behind action. And, and sort of uh, saying that somehow one cannot be action in all belief is also delusional. It's interesting to note that the passage uh, about the death of God, 17 paragraphs before that is a description of the Buddha, and 17 paragraphs after that is another description of the Buddha. So that uh, the, the Buddha, in, as it were, encompasses or bookends the description of the death of God, and one has to think about that. But uh, Nietzsche's position was that the only Christian died on the cross. Yes. And that, that's precisely right. that, right? So there's no question of a practice here. It, it, it's, it's, what I would take issue with is the question about the possibility of participating in the unique mode of existence of Jesus Christ. Right. In that, in that respect, Nietzsche's interpretation uh, is at odds with Jasper's on the point of, you know, whether this Christian way of life is at all possible. At, at the beginning of Zarathustra, there is an old man who believes in God. He doesn't tell him there is God is dead. He lets him believe in it. But that man lives completely alone, divorced of any uh, contact with anybody else outside of society. No, I think your, your, your point is correct. It can't be. Unless you are. Well, that's, like that, that, would be the, that would be a description of the holy man in second, the sec, in second uh, section of uh, uh, the second section of Zarathustra. You know, basically the holy man is out, out, totally secludes himself from, from, the, from the world and still praises God and lives in, in, in his right. isolation. Right? The hermetic way of life is still a way of life. 
Yeah. My point is that there is no yeah, Christian right. way of life for Nietzsche. That, that's the key issue. No, but he does, he does say in the Antichrist that a life like Christ is always possible. Living like a life of Christ is always possible. He says it. It's just that uh, no one really wants to take that radical, as someone mentioned, maybe that love of total love to the extreme that, uh, that Jesus um, embodied, number one. And number two, I think he really wants to emphasize the individuality, that every response to life is always an individual response. It's always something that um, each person anew comes up with their, his own philosophy. And Jesus has this particular philosophy that resounded with a lot of people, but it was, we lose sight of, it was his individual response to, to life. Um, and that's why he's interested in trying to understand what, what that life is, what it, what it could signify. Very, very coldly or, you know, dissecting the type that Jesus represents. Because we tend to admire Jesus because, oh, he's a great picture of love and all these things. And it may be, may be true, but let's look at where this love, this overpowering sense of love comes from. Is that, is that something that we should aspire to? Didn't but end well for Jesus. How would you define love in this case, uh, dear? Love, the kind of love that Jesus preaches. The, the notion of love that Jesus preaches. Someone, okay. a couple people Loving mentioned. Loving thy neighbor. The, well, Nietzsche feels, you know, rightly or wrongly, that that's a sign of decadence. That the feeling yeah. of love that Nietzsche preached is, why do, why do we ascribe importance to that feeling of love? I mean, not that love is not an important category for all for philosophy and religion, but why do we accord, why do we automatically assume that that notion of love that Jesus preached is something what, valuable as such, which is why he says, actually, it's a sign of decadence. What, what does love do with evil? Uh, if you love everything, then how do you deal with evil? Well, that's, that's the point. You, Jesus, I think that Nietzsche says by looking at his behavior in the cross, was precisely accepting and embracing the evil that, in a sense, he didn't condemn his executioners. Right? He doesn't condemn. That's the whole beauty, quote unquote, of, of this, this, this message. But it's based on a real impossibility, which is uh, embracing all forms of um, evil actions that could come towards us. That's an overcoming of resentment. But I think he says that Jesus' response was based on a morbid uh, response to not uh, to opposition and pain. It wasn't a what is a normal person would respond in that, which is we would normally have to overcome strong forms of of uh, uh, resentment toward people that do us harm, right? But if your whole belief system is trying to avoid pain and trying to immerse oneself in everything, it become it becomes a philosophy toward others. But it is Nietzsche it, thinks something just, unique to Christ. Something unique, unique to Christ's decadent physiology. Nietzsche is hardly embracing of everything. I, I agree. That's why he differs from Christ. He's, in that case, he differentiates himself from Christ. Yes, I agree. And this goes back to what I was trying to ask Martina, which is, can you love too much? I mean, yeah, I, really, I think that's I'm the... I'm really eager to hear your response to your own question. <laughs> I, I think one can. I think, in fact, the, the, the question is, is there a critical uh, element to Nietzsche's uh, position in relationship to the world? Uh, if you love and accept everything or do not deny anything, which is pretty close to what Nietzsche says, in that particular case, uh, love is it. That's all there is. All you need is love, as uh, somebody once said. It, it seems to me that 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 the the discussion of Christ and Nietzsche is in fact to both, you know, whatever, to raise both the question of this extraordinary quality of love that, that, that Christ has, but not to embrace it. I mean, he's, yeah. he's, he's admiring of it, but it's, it is, you know, I'm a political theorist. I mean, it is politically and socially uh, and culturally damaging. I, I, I have a question uh, about this, uh, Dirk. Um, you say that, that um, 
what he wants to do, Nietzsche wants to do is separate uh, Christ from Christianity. Yeah. And we're talking about this concept of love. Um, I'm wondering if you could separate some of the Christian values from Christ the figure himself. I mean, could you separate uh, concepts like uh, oh. empathy and sympathy, right? Uh, Nietzsche says something about, I, I don't like sympathy. It's not, I don't want to share a passion with anyone. Um, my passions are my passions. So I'm wondering if one can completely divorce Christian values from Christ. Um, aren't those values necessarily coming from Christ? Uh, just, just, just wondering about that. Yeah, uh, that's a good question and a hard one to answer. I, um, I think, um, th well, that goes back to the point, can you be a Christian without living a, sort of the radical nature of Christ? Can you actually be a Christian? Um, I think that Nietzsche is pretty radical in his point of view that it's just everything else is, is interpretation of a message that is really not what Jesus was about. And that Jesus did not even necessarily want people to follow him in terms of his lifestyle, like a belief system, but to practice, to basically offer a possibility of living this particular life. But it was not associated with the belief system per se, similar to Buddhism. That's, I think, how Nietzsche is seeing it, that Buddhism is a apoxis about how to remove oneself from life and to cultivate the inner life, right? And cultivate this kind of, not necessarily to change society, to, to offer a, 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 a dogma or a creed that everybody can say that. So you cannot, in other words, you can't be a Christian, essentially. You can only be you. Everything else is just people saying that they're Christians, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's just an interpretation. Okay. There, there, there's, there are two questions here, it seems to be important. One is, it seems to be relatively clear that Nietzsche uh, has nothing but uh, not always disguised contempt for people who espouse what they take to be Christian values, but without the belief in God. I mean, Georges Sand, you know, I mean, there's a whole thing in, in Twilight of the Idols in the second, latter part. Uh, about this, and, and you know, you can't just hold on to those beliefs without the underpinning, and that's and that's what most people try to do, and I think Nietzsche thinks that's extraordinarily dangerous. The other question I think, which is being posed here, is does what Christ preach preached lead to Christianity? Because Nietzsche was not crazy when he blamed Christianity for most of the world's evils. He may be a little crazy about it, but it is not a completely stupid thing to say. And that, that's and the, the link between Christ and Christianity, therefore, becomes important. That's why I, I think one has to resist the uh, Christ is good and Paul is bad sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, that's a line of interpretation, which certainly I've been pursuing. But, other, you know, but other ways, there are other ways to go. I, I think that I think that the real the real goal of one or one of the goals, and I think there's several goals that he's pursuing here. But one of the goals is simply to say that um, to open it up and to say that all you people who think you're calling yourselves Christians are not, and that Christ's example was if you really want to if you really want to follow Christ's example, fine, do it, be quiet about it. And everything else is just uh, an interpretation that that has uh, that keeps on through you know. But I, I, I that is an open-ended possibility. But it's 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 we can get over that. It's Christ was a figure in time. People who follow him call themselves Christians. It essentially means nothing, right? And of course, he's even more scornful because he sees what kind of a negative consequences come out of people who say they're Christian and follow. A particular that's the resentment values coming out it allows their will to power to uh to be enacted in in reality pursuing i have the correct message or i am good you are bad which is christ was not all at all about right as his example in the cross, cross show which is to, to to not oppose right to not oppose any kind of uh 
uh, opposition like that, just to say that someone's evil or whatever. Christian, Christians have not have never really adhered to that because they've always believed that their system is somehow superior. Is there that they're, they're better because they, they whatever it is that that so Christianity I think is by nature problematic for Nietzsche. That doesn't mean that a Christian can't be a good person. It's just that you have to be, you know, careful. So what's a good person? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was too. That's, that was much too that's, easy. That's that's right. That's why that we shouldn't be talking Jesus. about it. That's that why was we Jesus. Be <laughs> we shouldn't even be talking about good and bad. That's the whole point. Just talking about what is, what one sees. Yeah. So we need to move on to our second speaker. Um, it is uh, Rolando Perez. He works at Hunter College. He's the editor of the book Agora Poetics. Poetics after postmodernism. He offered the book on un anarchy and schizoanalysis, in which he details anti-fascist strategies for everyday life. Selections of his literary work can be found in the Norton Anthology of Latino Literature. The title of his talk today is Carl Jaspers Boundary Situations and Miguel de Unamuno's Hunger for Immortality, The Case for Existence and Reason in an Age of Irrationality. Thank you very much, Ruth uh, and Helmut, for inviting me to this. So um, uh, my paper today deals not so much directly with uh, Nietzsche, but it deals with uh, Unamuno. Um, and that's an interesting figure because Nietzsche enters Spain um, very early in the 20th century. Um, and uh, in Unamuno's tragic sense of life, which was published in 1915, there are numerous references to Nietzsche. Sometimes they are positive um, and uh, what he likes about uh, Nietzsche is his uh, emphasis on the passions, his questioning of reason. What he dislikes about Nietzsche is his uh, criticism of uh, Christianity. Um, and there are many references uh, as well to another philosopher that was also very important to uh, Carol Jaspers, which is of course uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, references, other references to German philosophers in the tragic sense of life uh, primarily are in all, all, very often the, the, the subject of pretty virulent attacks um, is uh, Wisconsin. The tragic sense of life is to be read as a great philosophical lyric, wrote William Barrett in the afterword to the tragic sense of life. That is certainly the way popularizers of existentialism like Barrett and read Miguel de Namuno in the 1950s and 60s. In other words, not so much as a philosopher, but rather as an existentialist writer along with Tolstoy, Sartre, and Camus. And until very recently, it would have been quite easy to dismiss his philosophical ramblings if it were not for the fact that we have reached a moment of cultural crisis and his ideas, as chaotic as they are, reflect where we are. From the very beginning of the tragic sense of life, it sets out in chapter one, the man of flesh and blood, to criticize, if not attack, conceptual thinking. A Catholic materialist of sorts, a writer who saw his worldview as one in line with Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard's anti-Hegelianism, Unamuno declares in the, first, in the first person, I am a man, no other man do I deem a stranger, end of quote. Thus from the outset, the central focus of his projects is the material flesh and bone I that ontologically constitutes him. This I is not the I of consciousness or selfless activity that somehow correlates with, exist of, with existence as in Descartes. It is not the transcendental eye of Fichte. Unamuno writes, to ask a man about his eye is like asking him about his body. And note that in speaking of the eye, I speak of the concrete and personal eye, not the eye of Fichte. And later in chapter two, the point of departure, he reiterates that his eye is bodily and concrete and that he would not want his eye to be confused. And I quote, not to be confused with that other eye the contraband eye, the theoretical eye, which Fichte smuggled into philosophy. 
nor even confused to the unique, also theoretical, of Max Turner, end of quote. In fact, Unamuno cares not for conceptual, rational thought. Philosophy, he says, is closer to poetry than it is to science. And in a passage that recalls Nietzsche, he, he, he states, our philosophy, that is our mode of understanding or not understanding the world and life, springs from our impulse to life itself. And life, like everything affective, has roots in our subconscious, perhaps in our unconscious, end of quote. It is said that humans are rational animals, right? writes Unamuno, but why not postulate that humans are affective or feeling animals? What differentiates humans from other animals is perhaps feeling, feeling rather than reason. Later in a passage where Unamuno reverses what he calls Hegel's aphorism, he writes, for to live life is one thing and to know is another. And we shall see, there may be such an opposition between the two that we may say that everything vital is not only irrational, but anti-rational, anti and everything rational is anti-vital. And therein lies the basis for the tragic sense of life, end of quote. The tragedy whereof he speaks is what Jasper call, calls, uh, called a boundary situation, and for Unamuno, the epitome of such boundary situation was the inevit inevitability of death and the hunger for immortality. If one briefly considers that for the ancient Greeks, tragedy was conceived as irresol irresolvable clash between the will and fate, and further that regardless of agency, fate would always have the final say, as in the case of Oedipus. It is in this sense that Unomuno too sees, too sees death and the will to immortality. Clearly, however, the anti-Cartesian, anti-Kantian Unomuno emphasizes the body over the mind. For though the word voluntad or will does come up once in a while, this, the desire to be immortal is not intellectual or even spiritual, but carnal or, or bodily. Therefore, such a desire is articulated as a hunger. When Amuno is not satisfied, he says, with achieving spiritual immortality, to be one with the universe posthumously, as, 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 as the cliche goes, was not sufficient for him, nor was the eternal contemplation of God. For Unamuno, preserving in his being meant the continuity of the particular bodily consciousness that constituted Miguel de Unamuno, author of The Tragic Sense of Life and no other Unamuno, or even the spirit of Unamuno. Moreover, when he admits to taking a materialist position with respect to immortality, it is clear that his materialism is not the materialism of the, at of the atomists, but rather a naive form of materialism. And there's, a, there's several passages where uh, uh, Unamuno even criticizes Nietzsche's notion of uh, eternal return. In the Tragic Sense of Life, or TSL, Unamuno cites a long passage uh, from Kierkegaard's concluding and scientific postscript. And it's important to at least reference it here because it demonstrates how Unamuno and Jaspers differ in their response to Kierkegaard. The quoted passage ends with Kierkegaard's critique of Hegelian abstraction. When you read in the philosopher's writings that declared uh, Kierkegaard that thought and being are one, it is impossible not to think in view of his own life and mode of existence, that the being which is identical with thought can scarcely be the being of a man, end of quote. And Unamuno responded to Kierkegaard by writing, what intense passion that is, what truth, lies in the bitter invective directed against Hegel, the prototype of the rationalist who relieves us of our fever by relieving, by relieving us of our life, end of quote. One problem here among many is that Unamuno seeks to relegate Kierkegaard's anti-rationalism to that of the mystical experience devoid of any kind of psychology. To be fully alive means to experience the hunger for immortality, but not to reflect upon it. Unlike Jasper, she leaves little room for empirical ex experience and self-reflexivity. In contradistinction, in recent in existence, Jasper writes, the ancient philosophical problem, which appears in the relation of the rational to the non-rational, must be seen in a new light through an appropriation of the tradition with our eyes upon Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. We formulate this fundamental problem as that of reason and existence. This abbreviated formula signifies no antithesis, rather a connection, which at the same time points beyond itself. The words reason and existence are chosen because they express in the most penetrating and pure form, the problem of the clarification of the dark, 
the, the grasping of the basis out of which we live, presupposing no transparency, but demanding the maximum rationality. The word reason has here its Kantian scope, clarity and truth. The word existence through Kierkegaard has taken on a sense through which we look into inf infinite depths at what, the, at what defies all deterministic knowledge, end of quote. Such a conciliatory approach is what is missing in Unamuno. And it is missing for several extra non-philosophical reasons. One, because when Ramuna want, uh, uh, wanted for political and nationalist reasons to differentiate Spanish culture from modern European culture, the culture of science and technology. And two, because in order to do so, he felt he had to return to the Spanish mystical tradition of Loyola, Juan de la Cruz and Teresa, uh, Teresa of Avila. Significantly, missing in the mystical worldview was a notion, was a notion such, that, such that of Jasper's encompassing. This dark night of the soul swallowed up reason, spirit, idea, being, and the other. Where Unamuno's solipsistic eye suffers alone because they cannot communicate his or her suffering through words or concepts, Jasper's reasons in existence negotiate the extremes of positivism and mysticism. And I quote here from uh, uh, Jonah Bermark. The extremes that Jasper criticizes are thus positivism object, objective knowledge, which transforms the world into dead mechanics. And mysticism without communication, concepts or, or, or speculative thinking, which is a kind of suicide, a complete erasure of empirical being. Pure, pure mysticism betrays the world, while pure positivism, positivism makes the living world impossible. In, in my view, uh, Jasper eludes the agonistic and tragic extremes through the encompassing, which is and is not a deterministic or, or determinate concept. Philosophizing that stays at the level of phenomena that merely de desires the knowledge of technical recipes for everything instead of an existence based on all the modes of encompassing as Jaspers will leave us in the lurch. The case for reason and existence is the case against Unamuno's tragic sense of life or what Jasper call, Jasper's called tragic knowledge. It may surprise Jasper scholars that Jasper was directly aware of Unamuno's concept of tragedy. After all, Unamuno's name rarely comes up in Jasper's writing, except in the small volume that bears the title, Tragedy is Not Enough, wherein he writes, and this is Jasper's. As a, con as a concept of aesthetics, the tragic has acquired a coloring which corresponds to this misleading type of tragic philosophy. As when Julius uh, Benson speaks of tragedy as the universal law, or Unamuno as a tragic sense of life. The most sublime aberration of a tragic worldview occurs when the truly tragic is turned into an absolute and made to appear as if it constituted the essence and value of man. End of quote. Obviously, it's not that tragedy does not exist, says Jasper, but to ab absolutize it can turn it into an aberration in a distorted view of the human condition. I quote, tragic knowledge is open knowledge, well aware of its own ignorance. To freeze it into a pan tragism of whatever kind is to distort it. This is Jasper's. Moreover, he says, tragedy often become, becomes a pose, a position assumed out of arrogance, where the sufferer becomes a hero of his or her own tragedy and everyone else a player of secondary importance out of touch with the grandeur of suffering and death. In the case of Bonamuno, his own personal and tragic suffering is so great that though he tells us in the very title that his sense of tragedy pertains not only to himself but, other, but also to other men and nations, we never see it reflected in anything he says. We know he has, he has no love for humanity because he tells us in the very first page of the tragic sense of life. Humanity for him is a concept, a disembodied notion, and one can understand his stance against such an abstraction. But on the other hand, his tragedy is wholly personal. It is nearly impossible to find any reference to any other kind, to any, any other form of tragedy. When Amuno suffers because he cannot reconcile his hunger for immortality with reason, with others who lack the glamour, what Jasper calls the lack the glamour of tragedy, do not. And because reason and the emotions are not reconcilable, then there is no truth. 
But existence is tragic for Unamuno because he is faithless with regards to the possibility of transcendence. He, unlike Jaspers, is trapped in a black box of unreason from which there is no escape. Failures to take into account a way out of the impasse, be it as in the case of having a master communicative reason or through trans transcendence as a Jaspers, can only lead to either a philosophy of instrumental reason that leaves no room for the pathos or an anti-philosophy. Thank you so much. Or does Uno Muno also see tragedy as something that has to be just personal? Yeah, the... I, that, that's a really good question. I think it is, I think for Uno Muno, it is it's very personal because um, uh, what Uno Muno really wants when, he's, when he has says the hunger for immortality, um, I mean, we have to actually take this, uh, when he thinks of immortality, he actually thinks of being immortality in the sense of maybe a child might think of immortality that he will die and he will keep his, his body and he will keep his beard and he will be, I mean, he will keep all the bodily attributes that are Unamuno. So uh, the tragedy for Unamuno is a very personal thing. It doesn't, it doesn't get out of the personal because it's, a, it's an existential crisis that he's living with. How do I reconcile this desire for continuing to be and not, and not just continuing to be in a, in a spiritual sense, but continuing to be in a bodily sense. How do I reconcile these, these, these oppositions in, in, in me? Uh, and so for him, I think uh, when he talks about death, uh, he talks about his own death. Uh, Jasper uh, has uh, in, uh, uh, talks often about death, but for Jasper, uh, death is, um, is also not just my death, but the death of others. Uh, and I think it's in philosophy, uh, volume two, if I'm not mistaken, it talks about the death of others and the significance of the death of others. Like for instance, the death of his, the death of his wife, that has a real significance because death for, him, for himself is not something he can experience. We cannot experience our own death. But for Unamuno, that's, the, that's exactly the tragedy that he can't, he can reconcile. He can reconcile something that he can't explain and something that makes bit perhaps no sense at all. Logically, there's this, this sense of, of immortality uh, with, um, with, with logic, with, 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 with reason. Um, so um, he also has a very sort of um, uh, one-dimensional view of reason. His criticism of reason is just very, very one-dimensional. Um, and that unfortunately, we somehow ended up there in some ways, uh, even in our, in, in our own culture. The question that I have uh, is directed to the reference to Unamuno's own particular constellation in a Spanish culture, which I found very instructive and illuminating uh, in listening to your paper. And it reminds me of, uh, Ed Papa will also know him, uh, and he was for a long time the older brother of the superior general, general superior of the Jesuits, uh, Adolfo Nicolas, who died, but uh, Antonio de Nicolas is still alive, and he is the author of Powers of Imagining, which is a discussion of, of Loyola and <laughs> Juan de la Cruz and Teresa of Avila, and he makes a point which I thought was super relevant to your own reading, because Antonio, he, he, as I said, he was my teacher, so I just call him Antonio, but Antonio's argument is that Loyola is bringing up a practice, a cultural practice of Spain, which is a practice of mysticism and an existential mysticism, which, which Antonio argues then gets formulated in the exercises. And you know, then, then, then we can get some very interesting things uh, or articulations of what those might look like in terms of uh, Desaad and so on. So for literary theorists, we'll then be thinking of Fourier and we'll be thinking of the Marquis de Sade and we'll be forgetting that there is something in these, 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 these imagistic, which is directly counter, and this is the argument that, 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 that the Nicolas makes, it's directly counter science. So it's directly counter a particular mode and way of moving the Dominicans. And that, or the 
or the what is going to be the counter enlightenment reformation, uh, 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 which involves a good deal of, of persecution. Uh, Christians who are not very Christian to connect that with the first uh, presentation. So I'm just I'm just wondering. Th I don't know if you're familiar with that book. I, you, you might not be. People tend not to be. But it is a translation of every single one of Loyola's texts. And in that sense, it's fairly interesting because usually maybe if you've done the spiritual exercises, you might have read the exercises, but usually you won't be looking at everything else that made the Jesuits so very important. And in this moment, couldn't be more important because the Pope's a Jesuit. Yeah, um, but, but you and I have some references and we started with some people. Uh, I studied Nietzsche with, uh, with uh, David Allison. And uh, I, I took a course many years ago with Antonio de Nicolas. So. so you know his book, maybe. Maybe you don't read his book. I, I do, I do. It's a, it's a great book. And one of the things I think that, uh, and I think that that, that view of, uh, of Loyola's mysticism, I think it's actually very different than I think the view of the mysticism that someone like Onomuno has. Because okay. one of the things that Antonio de Nicolas does, is he, when, he, when he does the exercises, the exercises are, really uh, bodily exercises. They're just not just m mental things, but they're spiritual and, 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 and embodied as well. I think the Nicholas's view of Loyola is quite different, I think, than, than Unamuno's. Uh, uh, very, very different. Uh, I was asking I think, about you, because your reading looked a little bit like Antonio's. Uh, uh, yeah, we 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 agree on we agree on some things and we disagree on others. <laughs> okay. That's very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. It's, it's interesting uh, uh, how writers enter uh, other other cultures. Uh, I've always been fascinated how, for instance, German thought enters Spain. Um, uh, they Kant uh, was really problematic for for uh, for, Sp for Spanish thinkers. So um, so Kant was actually was made to pass through um, the a sort of minor German philosopher uh, Christian Krauss um, to Krausism. So it became kind of Kant became sort of like a Catholic <laughs> in Spain in. Nietzsche was very problematic. Nietzsche was uh, very problematic because um, he was um, well admired, but especially, as I said, his criticism of Christianity. It just um, uh, and Spain was trying to define itself um, in with respect to modernity. Are we? Uh, how how is it if we don't join the if we don't join the 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 modern project? How are we to define ourselves? So they try. So they, there's this attempt to define themselves through through the mystics, as opposed to through mysticism and, 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 and the sort of irrational philosophy uh, to differentiate themselves from, from, from the rest of Europe. There's a lot of nationalism in it. Yes, that's, and and that, that's one of the things, I mean, I just taught, which for years I would not teach Antonio because are you kidding? I knew him, never, but I just taught his book. And one yeah. of the things that you find when you do something like that is that there were good reasons and bad reasons, and you need to know him in order to overcome the book, but but and, and to get the most out of it. But he has a great quote, which is just to yours, and you can maybe steal his quote, which is Nietzsche. <laughs> he quotes Nietzsche as saying, oh, those Spaniards, they destroy all of our prejudices. And it's a beautiful statement, you know, that that that, that Nietzsche and who, who, who calls Don Quixote the worst book ever written, <laughs> which is a strong statement. Um, <laughs> But to that appreciation, though, at the same time for the people is really the very important thing. So he can say something about a book that destroys, he thinks, the culture, which is uh, a Cervantes, which no one would say. It's, a, it's almost as bad as, you know, criticizing Christ. But then say something about the impossibility of comprehending the Spaniards. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I don't know what others uh, think here, but one of the things that I found, uh, because, the, because this becomes a sort of an iconic thing, be, uh, this, this agon between reason and, and irrationality, that I found, at least to, to, to my liking, and to my interpretation of Jasper, that Jasper has a way of accommodating these two aspects of, of, human, of human nature in a, in a, in a, in, in a, in a very constructive and... Uh, uh, in a worthwhile way. I think uh, his notion of reason is, 
is not instrumental reason at all, but it's much wider. And it's, uh, and I think that's, that's a way of, out of the impasse, that tragic impasse, right? Um, and uh, that's what I, that's why I, I, I like about Jasper's very much. I'm not a, a Jasper scholars, but I, I, I see, for instance, the notion of Jasper's um, uh, of the cipher script, something that resembles, uh, you know, the the hermeneutical impulse in Nietzsche. You know, um, it's it's, a, it's 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 an interpretation, uh, but an interpretation at many at many levels because you read this the 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 the, 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 the cipher script that can be read at many at, at many levels, uh, and for Jasper's human beings are almost antinomicals, you know, they were made up of these antinomies. And I think what's lacking in the tragic sense of life is um, this play of forces, these, that, that they don't have to be, um, they don't have to be tragic. They don't have to be, they don't have to be uh, negative, you know, it's, and I think that Jasper's notion of transcendence uh, sometimes works uh, for me at least, um, in a way very similar to um, the way that the concept of genocides or beyond works in Nietzsche as a way of uh, transcending uh, the, the antinomies. Question, Uno sure. Uno is often presented as a you know, representative Spanish thinker, but right. if I understand your point correctly, you're saying that Uno Muno received very strong Nietzschean impulses and that's shown by his abandonment of midlife, of sympathy, menschlichkeit. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? That's, that's right. Well, he's that's affected right. by modernity in some ways. Yeah, he's uh, exactly. And I think that, uh, I mean, he, he read, he read um, um, his knowledge of German uh, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't very good, but he had some knowledge of it because uh, there was very few, there were very few, um, Nietzsche books in night when he writes this he wrote the tragic sense of life in 1915 Nietzsche died in 1900 so um there were some there were some um there were some um translations of Nietzsche's work into Spanish and French but there weren't that many so um in the case for for Nietzsche he had to read most of it in, in German so sometimes you wonder whether he didn't get it right because he his German wasn't up to par. He learned Danish so he could read Kierkegaard. Uh, so um, he knew that there were all these other forces. They knew that there was this huge, you know, philosophical. Uh, one of the things that he criticizes and is very and Nietzsche does that that's as, as well is um, and so of course this Kierkegaard is a, ph a philosophical systems. You know, he's not. He, he's very critical of, of, of philosophical systems, uh, and that I think he gets in, in part from Nietzsche and in part from 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 Kierkegaard. Yeah. And uh, thanks for this 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 fascinating talk. I'm totally unaware of um, Unamundo, so I really liked how you were using him also to kind of um, like contrast to different models, right, of dealing with with tragedy. Um, my question is whether we actually, we can actually gain a model of tragedy that is neither nor, that is not a form of reconciliation that you were hinting at, you know, through your reading of Jaspers mm -hmm. with transcendence, like through transcendence, nor like a model of like strong antinomies that you were introducing through Unamundo, right? Because my sense, and you, you kind of alluded to that now when you were mentioning cipher script, and when you were mentioning that, um, that um, there's this strong hermeneutical impulse in Jasper's philosophy. Well, I think another impulse that's very strong is the impulse to communication yes. um, and to existence itself, right? And so I think, Mm, so I'm not entirely sure that he is really with the kind of um, philosophy he is introducing. He wants us to overcome tragedy or he wants to reconcile those antinomies. I think in kind of introducing those, like the strong um, concept of limit situation, 
which is, you know, death. You encounter death and it's not going to go away. He emphasizes the need for us to be in relation with those limit situations, right? And when we talk about resentment, when we talk about like how he reads Nietzsche, this is exactly what, what we're dealing with, right? How do we actually relate to those limit situations that do not go away? <laughs> and do we still want to phrase it in terms of our desire to immortality or not? Is this really something we want to desire? Because I would think... Jaspers at this point would say, you're betraying your own existence if you yes. desire to be immortal because you can only communicate, you can only be motivated to engage with others and allow others to actually question yourself. Mm -hmm. If you are in relation, in our, you neither tame escape nor romanticize and naturalize death and guilt and contingency and all those limit situations, right? So I would I would really like to um, to encourage the group to think about ways um, that are not in the box of, you know, we're kind of, we're just thrown, we're, we're basically in like a moment of had the Heideggerian thrownness, right? We kind of go back to BIOS, return us to BIOS. Um, nor are we kind of all in Zoe, all in kind of, you know, the Christian model of seeking transcendence and reconciling everything. I actually believe Jaspers is introducing a third model. Um, so yeah, would be would be great to talk a bit about it. I I I I really couldn't agree more. And I, I I, you know, for reasons of space and time, I took I took out some reference that I had about the the, the, the this very very important concept uh, that you've talked about, uh, the very dynamic that's missing, uh, and I think Jasper's that's get to that, and that is the question of communication. That is for me one of the things that's missing in Unamuno, not being able to get out of this 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 box right for jaspers communication is very very important um for unamuno it's almost uh, it, it, i think it is important but i don't know what if you're in, if you're enclosed in your own tragedy if you're enclosed in your own pain and you have no you don't really have any faith that this can be communicated you know, uh, through language or any or, or, or any or any other means that you're in, in, encased in your in your pain and your suffering, then there's no way to 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 establish that communication with the other. You're you're stuck in sort of a this solitary, very solitary place. Um, and so I think that you're absolutely right. I think that that's that's very important. That the the notion of of communicating it's it's your way out of that. You know labyrinth of solitude without that I, I don't know how we how, how how do we get out of that I mean it's self-negating in some ways because he is writing <laughs> and he is communicating his he's communicating his pathos and all that so it's sort of like there's something very contradictory in that right but I totally agree with you I think the 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 the, the notion the, the the of um and the importance of communication and intersubjectivity uh, and communicating at, at all kinds of levels is very, very important. On to our third speaker, it's Martin Prange. She's a professor of philosophy of humanity, culture and society at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. She composed a 2013 book, Nietzsche, Wagner, Europe. Further, she is currently a principal investigator of the research project Trolling Attacks, Attacks and Hate Campaigns toward a healthy use of social media in the public sphere. And right now she will be speaking on Nietzsche and Jaspers on living truth. Thank you very much, Ruth, for your kind introduction and also for your invitation. In my uh, research on post-truth, uh, one of the questions that I pose is, well, what I, I think we need to do as philosophers is rethink the question of truth in this post-truth uh, age. On the one hand, uh, in order to save the truth, huh? which is um, a real challenge for uh, Nietzsche scholars, I would say, um, who uh, obviously contest truth. And uh, I approach this qu new question of truth, so to speak, from, um, from Foucault's remark, actually, that we always need to return to Nietzsche 
when we pose the question of truth. But then in researching this question of who is speaking the truth, what is uh, difficult is that Foucault hardly uh, explains what he means with the truth when we talk, you know, when he talks about the Paresias as speaking the truth, it turns out to be critique. Um, and I think that is uh, really interesting with regard to, to Kant's question in what is enlightenment, you know, what is critique and how do we actually uh, criticize in public? And then comes in the question of the media, obviously, how do the media affect our perception of the truth or our notion of the truth? Uh, and also, especially our validation of the truth. Uh, and uh, at a certain point, I was uh, reading uh, Vanessa Lem's uh, article on uh, Paresia. And in, in that article, she at a certain point starts talking about embodying the truth. And I thought, okay, this point is uh, missing from my uh, question of truth. When I was asked by Ruth to, to come and join this panel, uh, I thought it would be great to turn to Carl Jaspers uh, because I uh, remember reading Jaspers on Nietzsche when I was uh, quite a young student. Uh, but now rereading uh, Jaspers uh, on uh, Nietzsche's view of truth, I found out that uh, I have actually some problems <laughs> with his interpretation of uh, Nietzsche's view on truth. And the main uh, problem for me is um, the fact that he touches upon notions such as life, living the truth, and um, incorporating the truth, but he, he never really comes to the level of living the truth and the relationship between life and truth. And I think the problem there is that he misses the importance of the body. How can we live the truth? In this paper, I seek to answer this question with the help of Jasper's explanation of Nietzsche's philosophy of truth. And I do so in the context of my argument that the age of post-truth forces us philosophers to rethink the question of truth at my proposal for a new multi-layered question of truth, which combines the old metaphysical question, what is truth, with Foucault's question, who speaks the truth, and the question, how can we live or embody the truth? This paper discusses the last sub-question, sub and I explore this by way of a close reading of chapter two, part two of Jesper's book, book uh, Nietzsche, an understanding of his philosophical activity. I do so against the background of Jesper's remark that in the study of Nietzsche, quote, in the study of Nietzsche, the unity of the whole, that is, of life and thought, can only be the guiding idea for Nietzsche's thinking will always elude all attempts at a well-ordered presentation, end of quote. It is exactly this point that I want to question. In discussing the relation between truth and life in chapter two, Jaspers holds to a distinction between life and world that Nietzsche doesn't make. It's precisely due to Jaspers neglect of the role of the body, I argue that he misses the strong connection, if not identity, between life, world and humanity for Nietzsche. In his chapter on truth in Nietzsche, Jasper states that Nietzsche's work is marked by three approaches to the truth. The first one being method methodical science. The second, the theory that truth has its being in a construction devised by a living existence. And three, a boundless passion for truth. Which together are intent on the dissolution of reason and leading to a transcending breakthrough, as Jasper claims. My interest is with the second approach, the theory that truth has its being in a construction devised by living existence. Jaspers reconstructs Nietzsche's views on this in the second part of his essay under the heading, The Theory of Exegesis, Truth and Life. Jaspers starts with the famous notion that according to Nietzsche, from the perspective of life, all that we can call knowledge is an interpretation. Now, and this notion or this view triggers three questions. What exactly does Nietzsche mean by interpretation? And second, what is the role of the body or embodiment in the act of interpreting? And three, what is the relationship between interpretation, the body, and Nietzsche's perspectivism? I think that is really important because uh, Jaspers doesn't refer at all to Nietzsche's um, perspectivism and hence his 
he misses the point of the body. Now, life in Jasper's interpretation of Nietzsche can be understood as human life because, quote, there is no truth that is not entertained in thought and believed that is not found within that encompassing being that we are, end of quote. In other words, knowledge and truth are always already embodied knowledge and truth. As Jaspers writes, I quote, thus conceived truth is not something independent, unconditioned and absolutely universal. Rather, it is inextricably involved with the being of a living subject and the world that he has constructed. constructed. But this world, as it appears to us, is like ourselves in a constant process of temporal change. End of quote. I have two objections against uh, Jasper's interpretation here. The idea that the world is something that is constructed by subjects and that the world appears to us as something we can observe. This all sounds a bit too Kantian to my taste. Although I believe that Nietzsche was strongly influenced by Kant's transcendental idealism to the extent that he agrees with the idea that we cannot uh, never know really how things are in themselves, but only as they appear to us. I would like to suggest that for Nietzsche, human beings are in the world. And with the world, they share the fact that they are submitted to constant change. As a result, human beings do not relate to the world as knowing subjects, observing the world, and determining its essence as a way of getting true knowledge. Neither do they observe the world and interpret it merely as it appears to us, reciting to the fact that they cannot know its essence. Interpretation is not a matter of looking at the world or even of understanding it as a text in Nietzsche's epistemology. Rather, I would say it's an active engagement with the world, an, engage, an engagement which always is already happening due to the fact that we are bodies and these bodies on a physiological and psychological level respond to and influence the world by offering forms of reactions, resistances, effects, power, and so on. There is a constant flux of power effects, as Foucault would call it, and it's on this bodily level that the idea of interpretation should be understood. That's what, what I would propose here. And being in the world means that human beings and the world share this constant fluid interaction, this flux, and that human beings, even if they have no rational control over the greater part of these interactions, understand that this is what life is, what they are, or what the world is, change. Human beings experience or live the truth that the true nature of things is change. Jaspers approaches the matter slightly differently, applying the notion of what he calls authentic tr truth. According to him, Nietzsche's skepticism means that he's determined not to be deceived by what appears obvious and unquestionable, and that he intends, I quote, by demolishing all that was prematurely established as eternal truth, to proceed to the authentic truth that is one with the source and illumines the path of living existence itself, end of quote. By remaining on the plane of cognition and denying the body as the apparatus of interpretation, Jaspers projects onto Nietzsche a uncomfortable oscillation between theoretical knowledge of the truth, understood as the essence of things, and a new authentic notion of truth, which then would lead to a theory of interpretation which triggers the rather unsettling question to what extent Nietzsche's theory of interpretation can be seen as truth or truthful, fulfilling its own criteria. Jaspers is actually uncomfortable with this. I myself never find this relapse argument very compelling, to be honest. For me, as such uh, an argument just means that we have landed, landed an aporia, and for me an aporia is not a reason to dismiss an idea. It's, for me, actually a reason the more to take the gap between what we can know and how things appear to us or are, uh, to take them more seriously. Uh, after all, philosophy requires coherent arguments, indeed, but our aim, I would say, is not to come to a closed theory, but to a better interpretation of that which unites us with the world, how we can make sense of life, and which makes it simultaneously impossible for us to come to definitive conclusions or knowledge about it. Indeed, Nietzsche's philosophy with its paradoxes and aporia forces us, like Kant's, obeyed very differently 
to transform our cognitive theoretical abstract relationship with the world into a living relationship, a lived experience that affirms the tragedy of our cognitive limitations. Jaspers obviously perceives this movement in Nietzsche. From the idea that Nietzsche is determined not to be deceased, he continues his analysis by turning to Nietzsche's idea that truth is not opposed to illusion, but is an illusion itself. Now, in fact, concluding that that is the result of the fact that our intellect is not universal, as in Kant, but that, I quote, every single kind of intellect must have its own way of understanding the world, end of quote. It's from this that Jaspers now distinguishes two notions of truth in Nietzsche, the truth about the world and the truth related to life. The first truth is related to how human beings conceive of the world. The second to error, that is truth understood as error without which human beings cannot live. Unclear though remains why truth is an error or why it is an illusion. In Jasper's explanation of Nietzsche, it comes down to pure individual perceptions leading to many truths and therefore to no truth on page 186 of the English translation. Thus, Nietzsche's skepticism would lead to epistemological subjectivism and relativism. This still doesn't explain the distinction Jaspers makes between human beings' perception of the world and truth in connection to life. On the contrary, he's looking for a bridge from the theoretical or perceived truth to lift truth or error. And the bridge is, Jasper notes, formed by the question, which truth serve life? As cognitive beings, we want to know the truth about the world. And as living beings, we need the truth to the extent that it helps us live. My question remains, what life is meant here? And the main thing that I would like to discuss, discuss with you is the question of the relationship between truth, life, human beings as uh, bodily beings. Did Jaspers get this right or not? in his discussion of Nietzsche, and my claim is that he didn't, and that is um, especially visible from um, the point uh, where he uh, talks about um, the incorporation of truth and error, which he then interprets as meaning to reconcile truth and error, and I don't think that that is the case at all. Thank you for your input. Uh, maybe the concept of um experiment Versuche might be helpful to you to actually try things out and, and see whether they enhance life. Nietzsche wants to affirm life as if he doesn't want to flee life. It... Life is an experiment, you mean? <laughs> like in yeah. the Fröhliche Wissenschaft. Yeah, not just there. Just there. Time about, you know, experimente. Uh, on page two, you say, um, and I'm not sure I would agree with that. It, I have two objections against Jasper's interpretation. Yeah. Here, the idea that the world is something that is constructed by a subject and the world appears to us as something we can observe. Uh, I would agree with the second part that the world appears to us as something we can observe, uh, that, that, that questions that. Why would the idea that the world is something that's constructed by subjects, what makes you question that? Because if you do deny that the world is something that we can deserve, observe, have a um, uh, concrete knowledge about what the world actually is, then what's sort of left is what you make of it, constructed by subjects. It seems to me that Nietzsche is heading in that direction. Yeah, it's. I mean, obviously, he uh, sometimes talk about how we observe the world or how scientists observe the world. But my problem with uh, with this is, or in how Jasper represents it here, um, is that the, as if the world is constructed by subjects, you know, as if there is a subject-object relationship for Nietzsche. And it's also clear that he wants to overcome that relationship. Um, and the second uh, part on, you know, as if we can observe the world there without understanding at the same time that we are actually part of that same world. And I think that uh, for Nietzsche, one of the reasons that he believes that we should look at the world with warm, warm eyes is because he's always... Uh, conscious of the fact that we are part of the world that we are observing and that that is already uh, that already brings a kind of tension you know the fact that the world is not 
for us there to be objectified. But it, this whole subject agree, object relationship is to be questioned. Yeah. No, I agree with you there, but that would still mean to me that you're constructing the world as, as a subject, even if you don't des designate, I mean, see yourself as a subject. If you're, you're, you're still interpreting the world as a subject, even if you are part of that world. Just going to make it more complicated. Are, are we entirely <laughs> happy with the notion of the world? It mm -hmm. seems to me to follow from what you said that the notion that there is a the world of which we have, per of which we have perception is is problematic, and then the whole notion of the perspectivism seems to me to cut against that. Yeah, that's the first question, and the second question is is this: Does it follow from what you're saying? And I'm nervous about this one. <laughs> uh, does it follow from what you're saying that our evaluation of the truth status of what somebody of what someone says depends upon our evaluation of that person? of his, his or her character, his or her quality. Now, the reason I say that is that it's one of the characteristics of contemporary science, post-enlightenment thought, enlightenment and post-enlightenment mm -hmm. thought, that the value of a statement should be independent, the truth value of a statement should be independent of whoever makes it. And I hear in what you're saying that in fact, the truth value of a statement cannot be separated from the person who makes it. Do you want to go along with that or not? I don't think you do, but I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I. Uh, so you are actually adding to Dirk's uh, question and to my objections, a third objection. Yes. So I yes, should indeed. make, yeah, not only question the subject but also the whole notion of world, because whenever we interact with the world, we are already interpreting. That's also something that I say somewhere. Yes. Uh, to to your so I would agree with that. Uh, so I would like to question this notion, the world, you know, uh, when it comes to Nietzsche. Uh, your second, as for your second point, uh, what I'm saying is that I am not convinced by the relapse argument. So I suppose that that is what you were referring to, uh, the fact that Nietzsche makes certain claims, and then, uh, for example, about you know the the idea that there is no truth. Yeah, already uh, is problematic because that would include that this statement that there is no truth can also not be truthful or something. And that is something that I'm not, uh, I find not very compelling or I, I, I would say that the discussion should not end there. And my point is not about um, should the value of truth be independent of the personality. Uh, it's something that, from a Nietzschean standpoint, is just impossible, I would say. For example, because yeah. everything is an interpretation, what I find difficult with Jaspers is that he makes it so extremely individual. So, uh, and then comes to this, I would say, a bit of an easy conclusion, because we are all individuals and we all have our own interpretation of the world. Um, conclusion, there are many truths. There's not just one truth. Uh, what I find difficult about this is that you come to a kind of relativism that also ends all discussions. And I think that if we want to, let's say, save at least the concept of truth um, in post-truth times, <laughs> relativism doesn't help us. Absolutism doesn't help us, but relativism or epistemological relativism doesn't help us either. And uh, it doesn't help us because a lot of people that... Um, like Daniel Dennett and uh, the, all the people that sell the self acclaimed uh, modernists refute postmodernism because they equate postmodern philosophy with relativism, yeah. with this epistemological relativism. And I think there's much more to say about postmodernism. Uh, and for example, Nietzsche's idea of a hierarchy of values, um, also his idea of perspectivism, I think are all ways to to try to escape this, uh, this idea of, of um, relativism, which is so unhelpful. I like a lot of what you say there, but just to add one thing, it seems to me that there is a problem if one thinks that the establishment of true statements is an epistemological question. If one had a good epistemology, 
Yeah. You know, knock down, drag out epistemology, then we get it. And I think that that is a problem with much of philosophy. And I think one has to begin to raise the question of is truth an epistemologically based concept? And I don't think this leads to relativism, but that, that's a big and long argument. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's uh, it, it's really important one to take because you're quite right is what what Dennett and and Minions do is is precisely to say and therefore relativism and puff. Yeah. Whereas I want to say it, it really uh, I do want to hold a bit to the it depends who says it. Well, maybe you can. Um, it sounds like you say that you know truth is also a matter of politics. <laughs> Or is well, all already political? I did write a book called The Politics of Transfiguration. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not sure if you, what you, you think what you just said is a refutation? Or, no, uh, <laughs> not at all. It's something I'm struggling with because uh, um, I try to approach it both as an epistemological and political problem. Huh? Truth. So uh, one of the things that needs to be addressed is, uh, is I agree with th this question. Uh, maybe we should break open other philosophical disciplines and say, okay, you know, epistemology should not have the, the last say when it comes to truth. If I read someone like, uh, you know, Cavell or Conant or people Cavell correctly or Emerson for that matter correctly, uh, I think they're moving in that direction. But that's, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of a lot of um, traps down that way. I have a question um, for for Nietzsche. Uh, truth is often derived from from the body, right? From physiology. He often talks about if we knew more, if we knew more about uh, uh, a philosopher's physiology you know and so much of Nietzsche comes from his, his own truths come from his own ailments from his own bodily ailments and problems and so on uh, I wonder whether that you mentioned that one of the things that was missing in you saw in Jaspers was this sort of the body seems to be to be missing in Jaspers or the importance of the body uh, in Jaspers um, do you think that that's something that is what's missing in, in Jaspers? And would that be a way of just uh, thinking of truth in terms of epistemology? There is this mind-body problem, I would say. One of the things, the dualism that Nietzsche wants to overcome. And I, of course, Jaspers knows this, but he doesn't really seem to um, include this in his interpretation when it comes to truth. He's, he remains there on this, let's say, cognitive level, as if you know, as if it's on the level of the mind cognition, and uh, doesn't seem to really understand how important the body is, or the fact that the mind is in the body or is already body, you know. And knowledge is an embodied, or interpretation is an embodied activity, and I find it very strange. But maybe, uh, so I'm trying to to understand. How, how Jaspers can miss this point. The answer there is, is not the date of the publication of that book. I mean, he, he is confronting a group of people who, in fact, are centrally concerned with bodies, that is the Nazis, and with the, what, and a good body and having and getting rid of decaying bodies and so forth. I mean, I think he's, he can't touch that. I mean, maybe that, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the reason or not, but it's, mm. it's one of the things you... You find actually much the same thing, believe it or not, I think in Heidegger, where Heidegger in the Nietzsche books, I mean, really denies the biology. Uh, and, uh, you know, partly because they've got people all around them who are saying it's all biology. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's... Uh, no, it's, it's something to take into account. Yeah, yeah thank absolutely. You. Thank you for... Bobby Dabovic is a philosophy professor at Fordham University. She was a student of uh, Hans Georg Adam and Paul, Paul Feierabend. And she is the founding editor of the journal Neo Nietzsche Studies, which are echoing the spirit of David Allison's 1974 book, The New Nietzsche. She has written 10 books and edited many more. The latest book she wrote on Nietzsche is in German. It's titled, one might translate into English as Nietzsche's Antiquity, Contributions to Classical Philology 
and music. She's known for foregrounding the role of politics in institutional philosophy. The paper she presents today is called Reading Nietzsche's Educational Institutions with Jaspers and McIntyre on the idea of the university and Severus Snape from J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter stories. Thank you, Wood, for the invitation. Thank you, Helmut, for the invitation. Uh, obviously, I've changed the title. That's I put it here, but I, it's also the new title. This one's different. This is about the acromatic. We should all know what this is because we took a course in Plato. No one does. I was in Tübingen. I have no choice. Hans Kramer, I suffered. I know. It's terrible. So one of the things we want to try and do is go, go through one of this I would love to have had an intervention with Martina's great talk and some of the others, but I already wrote a book that no one has read on Nietzschean truth and Nietzschean science. So I, I'm not going to fix it now. I read it. So what, what, what I'm going to do is just run through this because it is Jaspers who picks up the point. He says he's whipping Nietzsche off just as the question of Parhesia uh, in, in Foucault also uh, is stealing, which we only know because of Hado uh, from the person we never pay any attention to. And that is Lucian, that great second century sophist, you know, who says, you know, you're all, you're all wrong. Anyway, all great philosophers are educators. And I'm going to talk about masks really quickly. Education and Severus Snape. During the 2020 coronavirus pandemic, pandemic in a move executed using numerous, just like this, numbing, just like this, Zoom <laughs> discussions, but without debate, so not like this, uh, a decision was made to put everything or almost everything online or else in a hybrid or bastard mode to teach in person, impersonally, that is, lacking the person, lacking the face-to-face. -face. Thus, teachers from preschool to university now teach behind a mask, just as Socrates covered his head in his first speech on Eros in the Phaedrus, as pretext, so Platonists have told us, in order that he might lie more easily. And as Nietzsche says, I quote, a human being must learn very much in order to lie. It's a very Kantian observation. At stake, is the abolition of teaching and learning. I make, that's what's behind me, the case for the fictional figure of Severus Snape, named for the follower of a saint, celebrated for his ability to make a case to summon the dead for testimony. A character conceived by J.K. Rowling, she didn't invent him, she stole him from history, and portrayed by the late British actor Alan Rickman, is also behind me. Snape represents everything counterindicated by today's educational assessments, teaching evaluations, so-called best practices. I've never heard more about best practices than in the last three months. Uh, according to whom? As assessed by whom? For the sake of whom? Criteria now, and, and I've been, I'm very old, very white hair, you know, I'm, I'm ancient days. Uh, we never liked distance learning. We're now all for it. Very funny thing. We charge $48,000 a year for distance learning. Or else, that's the other problem with Trump University, self-arrogated rules, which we just did. No one accredited this. This hasn't been accredited anywhere. Correspondence learning, online learning. Yeah, this was Nietzsche education on the idea of the university. Carl Jaspers composes is 1935 study, that's what Tracy was mentioning before, of Nietzsche, arguably to educate a reading of Nietzsche in the context of National Socialism, where Heidegger is accused of seeking to lead Hitler himself, den Führer, Führer, as is typically said, and typically said in German by Jaspers, no one else but Jaspers. Jaspers continued a professorial tradition that goes back to Wilhelm von Humboldt, echoing no less in Nietzsche's own lectures questioning the future of our educational institutions addressed to educating political movements. To the extent that war and crisis factically occasion reflection on the university in his Rektoratsreda, Heidegger argues for a reset of university service in apparent dialogue, there goes a book, with some of Jaspers' 1923, The Idea of the university 10 years earlier. For his part, Jaspers echoes 
he doesn't quote him, echoes Cardinal John Henry Newman's 1852, The Idea of the University, same title. Continuing this tradition, Alastair McIntyre's 2009, The Very Idea of the University, revisits a question prototypically debated and just as prototypically neglected as a question three. On God and classics, on Nietzsche and STEM. Writing on Newman and the university, McIntyre argues that theistic, that's God, issues are decisive when it comes to secular institutions, which same institutions fail to comprehend those issues. And Newman's critics are affronted by what seems a contradiction. I quote McIntyre, Newman was well aware that belief that God exists is contestable and that there are no knockdown arguments, that's the original antinomy, equally compelling to every intelligent person for the existence of God. McIntyre, a specialist in incommensurable kinds, unpacks the problem at issue with deliberate care. It is characteristic of contemporary unbelievers to believe that only if they were offered some great knockdown argument whereby belief in God would be incontestable, would they be rationally entitled to believe that God exists. To which the theist has to respond that any being whose existence was thus justified would not be God. The issue is subtle. It's part of the reason Heidegger emphasizes the whatness of being, and it is a scotist point. No science, qua science, as McIntyre observes, he is citing Avicenna, proves the existence of its subject is true, end quote. Thus McIntyre argues it would have been Newman's view that the fragmentation of our curriculum is a condition that needs to be remedied, and that only an acknowledgement of theology as the key unifying discipline can adequately remedy it, end quote. This is because no discipline today could, this is McIntyre, be accorded the place that theology has in Newman's scheme. Notice, can't be science. But also because the claim that the knowledge of God is at once contestable and yet genuine and indispensable secular knowledge is at odds with the present day secular university's understanding of the secular. By contrast with McIntyre's theology, Nietzsche focuses, it's his stuff, it's what he does, he doesn't do philosophy, he's a philologist, he focuses on philology classics, and thereby the acromatic in his 1872 lectures on our, meaning the German, and the Swiss-German educational institutions. In this account, Nietzsche included the gymnasium, as only students prepared by studies at the classical gymnasium would qualify for admission to the university. That's why Einstein and Schrodinger studied classics, because they couldn't have gone to university if they had not. McIntyre emphasizes that the idea of a university disintegrates without theology, lacking deity. While for Nietzsche, lacking hermeneutic and he has two kinds, monumental philology, there is no educational institution. This mangel an philologie, to use Nietzsche's word in Jenseits von Guten Böse, is fatal, as he writes in his lectures on educational prospects. For take away only the Greek, along with philosophy and art. On what ladder could you still wish to ascend toward education? Nietzsche's talking philology, not philosophy. And he notes that the problem with philosophy is that many who call themselves philosophers are not philosophers. They do what they do, not for the love of wisdom, but because they're compensated. It's a gig. To this extent, Nietzsche's overall problem corresponds to what we call STEM. Can you get a job? Thus, Nietzsche reflects on the conversion, this is Nietzsche's argument, he makes it several times, of institutions of culture, Bildung, the older ideal of the university classically conceived, into newly applied institutions, as he says, for the necessities of life. And that should scare us that the word necessity, like necessary, anyway, comes right in there eliminating the practically useless quite for the sake of useful specializations. Four, the acromatic and the philosopher. The acromatic refers to the esoteric word of mouth heard from an expert 
sometimes epitomized as a word to the wise. One has to be able to hear it. You have to be up to it. So far, so good. As if, because really. But what's this about remuneration? Why am I talking about not paying people? Why is Nietzsche talking about that? Why did he quit his job after 10 years? Nietzsche filches his test for a true philosopher from Lucian in his Schopenhauer's educator. He just lifts it totally. That's an answer to Martina's question about Parhesi. It's right from there. Let the philosophers, that's part of the dialogue. He's, he's, he's there, he's talking. Grow untended, Parhesi. Deny them all prospect of place and position within the bourgeois professions. Cease to entice them with salaries. More persecute them. Show them disfavor. You will behold miracles. Suddenly, it'll be empty. Everyone will have flown the nest, for it's easy to get rid of bad philosophers. One has only to cease rewarding them. Jaspers quotes the same point, but he quotes Goethe on the venality of professional research by contrast with independent scholarship, the kind of scientist that Goethe was independently. Quote, those professionally concerned with it are not really interested in it at all, but are merely interested in money and personal power. That's Iaspera citing Goethe. And reminding us in his Nietzsche book that all great philosophers are educators, Iaspera argues in the idea of the university that what tends to dominate in the university, most of us work at universities, we know that this is true, it's very painful, is mediocrity. Whenever we have a new hire, we hire the one that offends nobody. Overall, the very translation yes. of thought <laughs> tends to impoverish, this is Jasper's, its intellectual vitality. On an existential level, that's the student's level. They are really talking about the student. Jasper's foregrounds inevitable disappointment. One's expectations are only seldom fulfilled at university. The first rush of enthusiasm does not last. Thus, Jaspers highlights the student's encounter with the person of the professor. It is to illustrate that person that I bring in Rickman's personification of Professor Snape. To this day, Potterheads, and there are plenty of them in philosophy, and especially in philosophy, condemn Snape as teacher. They hate him. I think he's great. They all hate him. It is as exemplar that Snape reminds his students that there's a level of rigor of study, of learning, of discipline, all the stuff that bores us, quite apart from magical thinking. Thus his prohibition on wand waving and incantations, all the stuff they came to do, they can't do in his class. Snape, himself expert in both of those esoteric forms, reminds his charges of the value of evidence-based magic. That's herbs for the rest of us, as it were, i.e. potions that work, that it be homeopathic things. They work. We have no idea why. And do so with or without one's faith in the matter. The exemplar corresponds to the Nietzschean language. Jasper's echoes. Thus, exemplifying Jasper's attention to exemplarity, Snape's lectures, not McGonagall, not any of the other teachers, are remembered down to the last word in passing in a hallway or consultation. The above speech on one waving, warning, people will think you're up to something, snarling, don't lie to me. And finally, training Harry to discipline his emotions, control his mind. The parallel with Snape underscores the relationship Jasper's invokes between student and professor and the dynamic of the lecture hall. Although noting, Jasper's notes, the stock objection to lectures is dead weight, more quickly conveyed in a book, administrators think this, and today we might argue for an asynchronous, or what are we doing right now, recorded version, Jasper's rearticulates Nietzsche's emphasis on the student as hearing lectures. You hear, that's all you do. Just where, quote, the memory of outstanding scholars lecturing accompanies one throughout life. Indeed, such exemplars inspired Jaspers as their teachers also inspired Heidegger and Nietzsche. As Jaspers writes on 
this aura, echoing Nietzsche's reference to the acromatic, through his tone, his gestures, the real presence of his thinking, the lecturer can unconsciously convey the feel of the subject. No doubt this can only be conveyed by the spoken word and only in a lecture. This is contra Gardamer, only in a lecture, not in conversation or discussion. The lecture situation evokes something from the teacher which would remain hidden without it. There is nothing artificial about his thinking, his seriousness, his questioning, his perplexity. He allows us to take part in the, his innermost intellectual being. For Jaspers, this is lost the minute it becomes contrived. For Ivan Illich, it's lost the moment it is institutionalized in school and university in a center. For us today, it's lost in any recording whenever the spoken teaching is inscribed, repeatable and as dead as any written letter. Thank you for your attention. They keep our recordings for seven years, the recordings of our lectures in our university. What are they gonna do with all those? You should be asking that question, I am. For me, that yeah. question, and I have a piece, I gave a lecture at the American University of Paris, organized by the psychologists there. We have to ask that questions, but we don't. Mm -hmm. One of the most stunning things is the silence of most academics on what we are now currently going my, through. My colleagues have no idea that they keep the, the recordings for seven years, but I am asking around and nobody understands. <laughs> Mm. Well, the, the, these questions of how long they're keeping them is yeah. irrelevant with regard to the internet because although Zoom itself keeps for a certain period of time, almost mm. any recording that is made can, of course, and is, of course, stockpiled and saved anywhere else, which would be convenient if you were to lose all of the professors. We're right back at the beginning exactly. of Alistair McIntyre's prediction at the beginning of After Virtue, and all science were destroyed understanding that as Wissenschaft or scholarship in just the way we understand it today, if then somehow all universities suddenly realized they don't need and they cannot afford, because our students will make this decision for us, we're not making it, we're not controlling it, our students will in fact be the ones who will decide for us uh, what eventually we wind up doing. They will say we will not pay. I didn't quote that number, 48,000, it's more than that, that Boredom mm. students pay for tuition alone. It's to be understood that that's not living, that's not food, that's yeah. tuition. And that's a standard price at a standard private school. But at a certain point, students are going to think a little bit about this because, and I've observed my own students from, mm -hmm. from last semester and the current semester, from the beginning of the term to the present term, they change the way they were in September is not the way they are now. And we have to wonder what will happen. They must keep coming back. But you still have problems where people will eventually cut these services because yeah. once you have recorded lectures, why do you need to give them again? Exactly. But the, the histor for the historical question, I had to think of Schiller's letters uh, on aesthetic education. And I thought, okay, these were letters. They were on education, actually. Uh, but in a way, it was also kind of distant learning. What is the difference between, let's say, the letters on education or Schiller, and which is also personalized in a way, it was a kind of personalized learning. And why do we have so much problems? I think it's it's more intuitive with me, I, I, with personalized and online learning. Obviously, my first point is a device and a pretext and has nothing to do with what I'm actually arguing. So that's the first thing. Secondly, the association with Schiller is metonymy, and it's a good association. But I think that the, the question is to raise the question about what the university is. And so when, I, when Jaspers is asking that question, he's asking it post-World War I. And what happens to the German university system Fritz Ringer's wonderful book on the Mandarins only is an, in the wake of these wars and these wars. Well, I assure you, historically, universities change. So sure. what will change? And one has to raise questions about this. I have no idea about the, I mean, I know that, that, that nothing takes place online uh, or, or, that, or, or, or that can. 
for a number of reasons. But what I think is going on with Nietzsche himself is asking a very complicated question in his own lectures on the future of our educational institutions. Yeah. What's well, interesting in English, I'm sure it's available in Dutch, and I'm sure it's not as much of a problem in Dutch, uh, and it's certainly not a problem in German, but it's a huge problem in English because we have two translations of that, and both are terrible. One is better, obviously. The second one is always a little better. I the point is only that when we're raising the question of what Nietzsche is talking about there, going back to Schiller on Bildung is not really going to be the question because he's raising the question of Erziehung. So his question is not, it's Bildung's part of it, absolutely. But what is, what are you being educated towards or, or, or what is it for? And the purpose he thinks is, and he has a lovely metaphor, he hates Hegel with such a passion that, that it's always a subtext. <laughs> Um, in, in his writing. And so what he says is you, it's a, it's a slave girl, it's a servant girl, you know, who the one who, is, who will teach you how to get a job, job coach, help you get a good position, yeah. a, good, a, good, a good appointment. The job focus, which is the reference to Lucian, philosophy for sale, was the name of the dialogue. And that particular passage that Nietzsche is quoting is a passage about the fact that philosophers do not live, we're back to Dirk's paper, actually, uh, what they do. They, they do not live what they actually write and teach and so on and so forth at all. So it, it, there's a whole big problem with that. And that's what Nietzsche is talking about. He's talking about our students, students. What are they? What is a student? How would you define a student? What do students do? And his answer should work for what we're doing right here with Zoom. To her, they listen. What you, you, you go and you hear, it was heard, and you, you, you hear someone talk. You don't have to meet the guy. He doesn't have to write you a letter of recommendation. It's enough that you <laughs> sit in their classroom and they're a student. Now, Gadamer, therefore, had my teacher had a lot of students, thousands and thousands, who would have, whom he would have taught in that same way in a German institution. In Boston College, you could actually talk to him, visit him, and I did all of that. So I was lucky, better off than most of the students. But it's not about that. It's simply, did you hear the man? And mm -hmm. that is the point that I think Jaspers is emphasizing. The, the amazing thing about Jaspers is how broad Jaspers is. When I was in uh, with Helmut last time when we met, uh, you know, <laughs> saliently in person was in Athens. It's an extraordinary appointment over five days. But it's a it's Jaspers way beyond the limitations of certain philosophers, as we will understand that. And that tunnel vision of not knowing this is is culpable. One should know this. But the tunnel vision of not knowing what Nietzsche says is also culpable. What is he talking about? It's, an, it's, it's a huge bunch of questions which we have. And most of us don't understand for the very simple reason that Nietzsche single-handedly invented the German language as we speak it now, stylistically. So he did he did things with stuff. I mean, it's not like Austin, as Tracy will always say, how to do things with words. Nietzsche so changes the way you speak that we, 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 we can make a connection with Schiller. My, my question has to do with Gadamer. You made a quick mm. comment that Gadamer doesn't, in his hermeneutics, doesn't belong to this uh, tradition of the hearing of the word. <clears throat> but in this, in the a little hidden part of uh, Truth and Method, where where Gadamer talks about the inner word, isn't he suggesting exactly this type of hearing? Is it, and that's exactly at the heart of Gadamer's hermeneutics, right? That's the, the metaphysical core of it. So Gadamer would be on the side of the angels, wouldn't he, if I'm not mistaken? You're absolutely right. Gadamer would be on the side of the angels, and he would also incorporate uh, in his person what you have just said. You are completely right. He was it. That's yeah. absolutely true. You, 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 you would have to know. Well, I remember a couple of years uh, ago, many years now, people came up with, well, Gadamer was a Nazi too, you know, born in 1900. Why not? He was 33, perfect, perfectly of age. And very few people who were his students thought, oh, yeah, Gadamer was a Nazi. Yeah. They didn't think that. And they didn't think that not because he assured them that he was totally not a Nazi in no way, but because you knew him. Yeah. He lacked, unfortunately, <laughs> even even the guile that Heidegger ex apparently had in spades. Yeah. So there well, I, I live in Germany now. I'm not too far. I see behind yeah. you. Yes. The Kölner Dome. 
not too far from Oldenburg, which is the home of Carl Jaspers. And I participate in the Carl Jaspers Society. It's my main philosophical venue. Uh, but, but what you mentioned about, you know, anybody who was uh, active during the Third Reich, like uh, Nikolai Hartmann, is automatically judged a Nazi. I mean, that's part of the whole pathology. Right? I can say that as an American in Germany, just this incredible distancing from the, the, the fathers and the grandfathers and so forth. What they don't understand is that it's the Socratic question, right? As a philosopher, and this is what I think American philosophers, if they're serious, should also take into consideration. It, it's kind of a Socratic question, right? At what point can't you continue to do your philosophical work? And in the Apology, Socrates is very clear when that point came, right? When they were about to let him off the hook, that's when he let him have it between the eyes, right? Because he knew he couldn't continue his philosophical activity. Hartmann and Gadamer decided, Gadamer also in the, in the Didier, which was not all that different, that he could continue his activity. And this is something that you can uh, disagree about but it represents his understanding of his own activity as a philosopher. I agree with that. I also agree with that because he was very, very proud of the fact that when he was informed by the new authorities at the university, when he was rector at Leipzig, that he would need to remove Nietzsche's name from among the students because Nietzsche was persona non grata and right. someone you did not want. It's like taking down a statue. Right. Uh, he said no, right. because, because Gadamer was classist. So Gadamer was a philologist as well, and that's the second point. But the reason I said that Gadamer would be excluded from what was being what, what Jaspers is saying here is because in Gadamer's writing, he stresses conversation. Yeah. And so for Gadamer, as for many other thinkers, could occur, and and we have a kind of new hermeneutics. I mean, there's Nietzsche's hermeneutics, which he got from ritual. That's 19th century hermeneutics, and that's going to be the inner word that you're going to hear. Gadamer is very urbane. So for, as far as he's concerned, anyone, the Italian waiter, everybody, everyone can come and everyone can talk and everyone should and everyone will understand differently. And to me, that's Gadamer's greatest contribution to truth is recognizing that when you have understood, you have understood otherwise when you've understood. So for, for, to, to, to my mind, we need to recognize that utter transformation. That's a translation to our terms our understanding of capacity. And what Jaspers in context is talking about there, however, has nothing to do with contact with the professor, raising your hand, interaction, supporting the student. It's nothing to do with that. It has to do simply with the ability to see this guy walk into class this way and do this with the podium. Yeah. Just that. It's what, it's what you learn from David Ellis. Yeah. Well, from uh, Klaus Hartmann and Tübingen, excellent. Okay, better, because then you'd believe it. Like I said about, about Antonio de Nicholas, you know, you know, if you know him, you disrespect him on an American level. In Tübingen, you learn that you can't do that. How would it, you know, how could you use it as in developing an argument against online teaching? Well, you, it's, I'm not... Don't be absurd. You think I was arguing against online teaching? I do it. Yeah. So this isn't the point. The point is to understand why Nietzsche would talk about the thing, would write the kind of thing he writes when he writes on the future of our educational institutions. I have been reading Nietzsche for years since I hated him. I have been reading Nietzsche. That's a really long time. So because when I started at college, I know this guy says bad things. Look what he says. No way. Uh, when you read on the future of our educational institutions, what on earth do you do with it? Most Nietzsche scholars say, well, it's strange. We don't know. We'll do this. this. It's odd. It's unusual. We can't order it. His most recent translation is anti-education because we just, what's he talking about? If you read that text, one of the things that's interesting about it is that he, you can read him together with Jaspers. That's all I tried to do. That's already mm -hmm. a lot. Make an argument about that requires that we have read the text. Two, two things. One is, it would be very interesting, it seems to me, for someone to write something which started with on the future of our educational institutions and then went to Max Weber's Wissenschaft als Beruf, at which lecture Jaspers was present. 
and then and then to the idea of university because they are all dealing with the same kind of pr problem and they go together in complicated ways and they also show a development over you know a period of what i guess it's 50 years there so forth but the the Wissenschaft takes up exactly these problems with the university and it takes up actually the second question which i wanted to raise here which is to go back to something Babette said about exemplarity. Uh, what you saw, I think, in, in Gadamer was an exemplar. And by that you meant someone whose excellence was such that you could not be uh, indifferent to it. And that, the question about online is, does the online teaching make that possible or does it undercut that? Uh, and it's it's very hard. I mean, it's it's to to, to, to figure that one out. Uh, I know that what has been most important in my educational development was seeing one, two, three. I can think of three undergraduate and two, three, four, two, three graduate student graduate education of people who, hey. They're doing something that is really important to me. I don't know what it is, but I want to find out. And that's the exemplarity. That goes back actually to the question you and I, Martina, were having about sort of uh, does the statue, uh, the validity of a statement depend upon who makes it? When you have an, exem an exemplar, what you have is that what that person says has validity simply because that person said it. Now, not anybody makes is an exemplar. God knows how many bad lectures I've sat through. But occasionally... Okay, okay. Gadamer, Gadamer gave bad lectures as well because Gadamer always let other people talk. Always. You're not letting me talk. If, That's if, you're, <laughs> if, you're interested, if you're interested in hearing what the professor or the speaker has to say, you want to hear yes. it. If you don't, you're just hoping someone else will liven things up. It's the message I tell my, tell my students. I say to them, ask a question and you will hijack everything for your interests and purposes. Do so. So one of the, because my job as a teacher is to give people useful advice, but it's a very important thing, but it's always derailing, always, because you're not necessarily interested in what is being said. One of the things that happens with the Vorlesung, which is a really important thing, when Nietzsche has, for, has Vorlesungen, he spent 10 years at university. He spent has more writings that he wrote out, wrote them out. No students took his lecture. Five volumes. Which, which most Nietzsche scholars have not read. And, and it's a very, very important and frightening thing. Isn't it? Well, he must have sucked, is what we say. But there's a big problem there. One reason I, I'm doing this, to answer Martina's very powerful question, you know, where's your argument? You know, just analytic question. And we philosophers just love it when analysts oh, say that. I didn't phrase it that way. <laughs> because, because we all teach logic. I used to teach logic because I don't have to argue with my students about their grades. It's like, obviously, not a syllogism. Anyway, the point is to read Nietzsche and Jaspers together. Because me, one of the interesting things is that they're talking about the same thing, about hearing the professor. It is about hearing. It is about that word, which I put in the title, which didn't help me, aquamantic, <laughs> and a word that all of us should know because it is part of the Plato that we learned to begin with. It is crucial. It is not about anything but what is spoken. It cannot be written down. It's a very, very important thing. Now, the part of me, when I wear a hat called digital philosophy, which I write on, that, that tells me this is writing, what we're doing now. As we speak, to the extent that we're able to pay attention and put ourselves on the other side of what, how we're dealing with the Zoom, we're here together, the presence. It's one of the reasons that I value the asynchronous in, in my Zoom teaching. But it's hard because it, people can't. It's, it's, it's an immense concentration to actually be where you are not, right? It's very, very hard. But, 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 but Nietzsche is also talking about that ability to hear and, and how strange it is. So he says, what would you say to someone who, and he uses this language all the time, a traveler? 
one of the strange things that he's referring to is someone from another planet. Same thing that Kant would say, same thing David Hume says. So it's a very, very odd way of talking, but it literally means what we're doing with AI. How can you program anything where it doesn't have context and where it doesn't know and how to fill in any of the blanks? You're going to need, and we're all learning this, we're all being trained in AI right now because they make us take online quizzes, right? In order to make the university happy and do this sort of thing, et cetera. And what you learn from the online quiz is how to pay attention without paying attention. It's the listening. The reason the argument that I'm making is simply to say there is a connection between what Nietzsche is doing in the uh, future of our educational institutions and there is Jaspers. And what Jaspers is doing is also talking about, I think, this question of something almost intangible. I don't know if that speaks to what Ed Pop is saying about this inner voice, that inner voice is always because almost everybody is evangelist and so on and so forth, and that's fine. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what it means to hear. And and I think that's hard. And I think that is also Nietzsche's question from the beginning, right? You know, you know, how can you get people to hear? And as a teacher, he knew that that was a challenge. This might be a, a good ending to our discussion. Excellent. And thank you for your impassioned deliveries and animated discussion. It was really great. I, I, I loved it totally. And I think I speak with this for everybody present. So thank you. Thank you thank so you much. Helmut. It was actually one of the best sessions. <laughs> thank great you. to see you. <laughs> Cheers. Take care of it. Yes. Tschüss, tschüss, Lee. Alles gut, tschüss. Good to see you again, everybody else. <laughs> Thank you.